Live from WDET in Detroit, this is the Metro. I'm Nick Austin, flying solo this week as Tia Graham enjoys a well-earned vacation for the week. Today on the show, a recent book about Dearborn explores the city. We'll have that conversation for you in the fictional space, as well as a new opera that's coming to the Detroit Opera House, highlighting the dazzling world of animals and the context in which we all live. But to start the show, as I did mention, Dearborn is a very important city for us here in Southeast Michigan, one of the many interesting suburbs we have sandwiched between Detroit, Inkster, and Down River. It's home to about 100,000 people, which includes a new, new and old Americans from around the Middle East, as well as longtime Detroiters. The rich diversity of the city makes it both captivating and difficult to capture as a writer. But Ghassan Zinedine tries to do just that. He was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in the Middle East, but he lived in Dearborn while teaching at the University of Michigan-Dearborn. In his new book, Dearborn, he tries to hold many things together, particularly the ways in which the city seems to exist in dialogue between the things brought here from Lebanon or Syria or Palestine with the sports teams and businesses and music animating Detroit and its suburbs. To talk now about the collection of short fictional stories and the city of Dearborn, we're joined by Ghassan. Ghassan, welcome to the Metro. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me, Nick. I'm, I'm really honored and delighted to be on your show. Yeah, well, we're happy to have you here, especially hearing this backstory for you, someone who didn't even grow up in Dearborn but decides to write a fictional book about the city and the people there. So let's just start from there. How did you get interested in the city like this in the first place? Right. You know, it's interesting because it, 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 my interest in the city um, started from years ago um, when I was much younger in my teenage years. Um, so as you, as you mentioned in, in the intro, I, I, um, I uh, was born in Washington, D.C., but I grew up in the Middle East. And we, my family um, moved to the States in the early 90s, and we were living in the D.C. area. And, um, and but we had uh, I, and I never like you know growing up in D.C. from the age of like ten, eleven, and onwards, I never really had any um, Arab American friends. But um, but um, my parents would always order um, uh, batlawa like uh, uh, sweets, uh, yeah. Lebanese sweets from um, Shatila, which is a famous sweet shop in in Dearborn. And so I I, I knew that there was this place up north in Michigan that um, where a lot of Arab Americans resided. Uh, and it started when I was, you know, uh, in my teenage years, and my, my parents ordering um, um, stuff from Michigan. And my aunt, her husband, uh, had actually attended uh, Detroit Mercy, and he had family in the Detroit metropolitan area. So I, I, I knew that there, was, there were a lot of Arab Americans up there. Um, flash forward years later, um, when, um, when I was in graduate school, I started researching um, – Arab American literature and Dearborn often appeared in a lot of the novels I read about. And so I did a lot of archival research and I really became just so fascinated um, by the city. And it, it sounds strange, but I had yet to visit it. And But when um, when a job opened up at the University of Michigan Dearborn to teach creative writing and Arab American literature, I just jumped on it. And it's from there that, um, you know, um, I just really took to the city. And so it, like, there were years of me mythologizing the place. Yeah. And then when I got there, I just became yeah. so fascinated long, by it. Just to jump in to get some context then. So you get to Dearborn as a professor. How long are you living in the city then for that stretch of time? Uh, about five years. Yeah. And so in that five years, you've said that living in Dearborn was the first time you felt you belonged to a place, which I think would seem really incredible to folks who are hearing out there. Can you tell us what that means and what did that feel like for you at the time when you moved to the city? Yeah, it meant, it meant the world to me because, you know, like I was saying before, um, I, I living in, in the D.C. area, I didn't really have any Arab American friends. And um, even and, and then I actually lived most of my twenties in Lebanon. And although I do feel at home in Lebanon, I still feel like an outsider. Like when I speak Arabic, it, it's um, people can tell that I've lived abroad. 
But in Dearborn, what was so interesting about it, um, because it has the highest concentration of Arab Americans in the country, um, you almost feel like you're in an Arab city, although, you know, it it is a very uh, American city. And um, there's really no place else like it um, because, you know, you're you're in an American city, but if you're – on the uh, if you're in the east part of town, uh, the Arab part of town, you see store signs in Arabic. Uh, you speak uh, Arabic to patrons, the customers. You really feel like you're almost in in, in the Middle East. Um, and um, I, what was interesting also about it was I encountered so many people who um, were try- were also navigating what it meant to be Arab and American. Yeah. You know, um, and so it, it seems as if a lot of people had like this kind of like identity crisis, yeah. which I was very familiar with. We're speaking with Ghassan Zinedine, who's the author of the book Dearborn, which is an assortment of short stories, fictional, but based in the city of Dearborn. You know, Ghassan, before we get into a specific story from the book, I've got to wonder, you when you choose a setting like a Dearborn, uh, it's obviously very intentional for you. As a creative mm-hmm. writer, what does a place like Dearborn, uh, which we're familiar with here, allow you to do when you're creating just your series of short stories? Yeah, you know, it's such it's such a vibrant and diverse place. Um, and there, you know, there's so many different Arab ethnicities um, that, that, that you'll find in Dearborn. So, yes, you have a big Lebanese community, but you have a thriving Yemeni community, a thriving Iraqi community, Palestinian, Syrian um, communities. Um, so that, that, as a writer, that's something that's very exciting because you, re- you really don't see that in other communities. We have so many distinct Arab ethnicities uh, coexisting. Um, so that was something that I really wanted to capture in the form of a, um, a short story collection, because what a short story collection offers, it offers the writer um, the opportunity to capture many different voices. So I thought that would really work well in trying to capture Dearborn. Yeah. And, you know, I think the f- beginning story is also an example of this. Your book begins with the story of a man named Yusuf Bazi, who's a census taker, but also sort right. of a failed actor. And when I think about how he's going along talking to all of these people through his job collecting stories, it kind of reminds me of what you're effectively doing with this book. So can you kind of, did you you see yourself kind of in that role when you were creating this book or why was it important to start start with this story of this census taker who's speaking with all these people yeah but i mean exactly i mean i i, I spoke to so many people um in in the writing of this collection and it wasn't it wasn't to fictionalize anyone's story but it was just to kind of gain further insight into the city into people's experiences so like every single single short story has some kind of like, has um roots in me researching the city talking to people from dearborn but you know the opening short story the actors of dearborn uh, like you said it, it, it's set during right, right before the 2020 census and it, and it follows Yusuf Bezzi, who's canvassing the neighborhoods in east dearborn and that was actually the first short story that i wrote for the collection and it re- really was a direct response to what I was seeing and experiencing while living in Dearborn. Um, that was during the Trump presidency, and, and there was just so much anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim rhetoric. And there was a high a presence of ICE agents in, in, in Dearborn. And I remember the anxiety that that caused for people. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but, I, you know, my wife and I used to always visit this um, – it's still there – but this diner called Hamido, right, in East Dearborn. And um, during um, – in, in I think it was the summer of 2019, uh, two ICE agents actually raided the diner. And luckily, the supervisor knew his rights, and he didn't hand over any paperwork on his employees. Um, so it was just me trying to capture that anxiety, that atmosphere, and I thought – You know, a census taker, if he's going around the neighborhood, he would be able to get a sense of the anxiety that everyone is feeling and experiencing at that particular time. Yeah. And, you know, another thing that you mentioned, of course, is this collection of different ethnicities, a lot Mm -hmm. from Arab American communities. And, of course, you mentioned when Trump uh, became president. I know that had a lot of anxiety. But right now there's also a lot of anxiety, of course, because of it being an important site for protests, calling for Israel to declare a ceasefire. You have the war in Hamas, a lot of harm that's happening over there. So when you look at what's happening at this point now, uh, does any of that 
inform uh, what you were thinking about when, um, I know this book was created a little bit earlier, but kind of get to what you're trying to do with this book. What is your take on how what's happening there informs uh, how you're presenting this collection of different ethnicities? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, so like, like I was saying before, you know, Dearborn consists of many different Arab ethnicities. Um, so for instance, uh, like the Lebanese community, um, so there's been a history of Arab immigration to America, starting from um, the late 19th century. There have been different ways of Arab immigration to the United States. But uh, some of the – one major wave, at least from, from Lebanon, was uh, during the Lebanese Civil War, which is from 1975 to 1990, and particularly during uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. And there were so many Lebanese who um, um, left southern Lebanon – um, to Dearborn uh, right after the Israeli invasion of 82. And then, you know, um, you have the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, which led to the Iraqi Civil War, which led to a lot of Iraqis uh, emigrating from Iraq to uh, to um, to Dearborn. So, you know, there, it, it's, Dearborn is a very transnational city, and it's um, – it continuously receives a lot of immigrants from the Arab world because of the political turmoil uh, in the Arab world. And I, I know from, you know, in a lot of my short stories, I, I, I try to explore um, um, trauma like the, the, that uh, certain generations have experienced, especially in Lebanon, they've experienced some kind of war trauma. And sometimes their, their children inherit those traumatic experiences. And so I think that really links to what's going on now today with the situation in Palestine. And it's really triggering so many traumatic experiences uh, in Dearborn, um, whether from, from the different wars, from, from, um, from really just horrendous U.S. foreign policy. Um, so I, I think that, that that trauma, that triggering of trauma continues. Um, and, and that's something that appears in the story collection. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you want to see that story collection again, the book is called Dearborn. It's a set of short stories created by the man I'm speaking with right now, author of the book. And thank you so much for joining us, Ghassan Zinedine on the Metro. Thank you so much. It is the Metro on 1019 WDET. And coming up, we'll talk about a new opera that's set to begin at the Detroit Opera House. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET, where I am Nick Austin. And, you know, as humans, we often think of ourselves as taking the center stage in our lives, in the lives of others. But we don't exist in isolation. There's an entire ecosystem of plants and animals that come to shape our lives in ways we don't often give credit for and sometimes don't even recognize. It's a little bit different in the cunning little vixen where a fox and a forest take center stage in the story's plot. It's an opera that's coming to Detroit May 11th to May 19th, and to discuss it now, we have two of the people involved with us. Mane Galoyan is a soprano and is singing the title role of vixen in the show. Mane, welcome to the Metro. Good morning. We're also joined by Roberto Cobb, who is the conductor of the show and the Detroit Opera's music director. Roberto, welcome to the Metro. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I'm happy to have you guys here. You know, opera was something that took a little while to grow on me until I performed in my first pit orchestra okay. and got to see one written by Maurice Ravel. And then I thought, you know what? There might be something to this opera <laughs> thing. But this opera that you're having right here seems like it's something that could bring in a lot of different perspectives, especially when we think about this title character, the cunning little vixen. So to start, I guess I'll start with you, Roberto. Tell me, what is Cunning Little Vixen all about? Well, it's a story about the interaction with animals and humans, basically at the core of it. Uh, and it's a story about a vixen, and we we see the vixen from basically from birth, and she uh, pretty much gets um, she gets taken by a human, the forester, the other main character in the opera, 
and we go through the vixen's life and the vixen uh, goes through the capture and then escape and then love there's a, a beautiful love duet with a fox and then ultimately uh, we follow her journey all the way to her death uh, and there's a lot of action sort of in between where there's interaction with mosquitoes and badgers and also other humans. It's really a, a very, very fun story. All right. Well, we do have the title character, as I mentioned, the Vixen here with us. So for you, Mene, when you're taking on a role like this, you know, we know what it's like to be a person. To be a fox, not quite as much. At least I don't have that experience. <laughs> so for you, when you're thinking about a role like this, do you approach it in a different way or what are you trying to convey, especially taking up the lead in a story like this? It is indeed a different process of work uh, because, yes, as you said, we know how to be a person, although it's different to impersonate different characters, different uh, people in operas. But uh, yeah, being an animal is a little more difficult. Uh, but in this production, it's easier because we have these uh, walls and we have projections <clears throat> and um, we poke our heads out from uh, portals and our bodies are the projections and we we are in costume. So wait a second. So what you're basically telling me is because of where your head is, you're behind like a screen. So your body's going to be filled out by this projection that kind of makes you look like a fox. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay. From a cartoon. The technology has really, so at its core, right, when I think of opera, I think of one of the things it's like you go in and you see an opera and you might effectively be seeing the same thing someone was seeing in the 16th, 16th century or the 17th century or whatever. I might be a little early on that. But the point still is it was kind of more of like a simple median. But now with technology, it allows us to do a lot of different things. So for you, and I'll go back to you, Mene, uh, do you think you lose any kind of authenticity with your opera when you add this technology, or how does it supplement what you guys are doing there? I think the way uh, Yuval Sharon is doing this, it doesn't take anything away from mm -hmm. authenticity. I think it's, uh, e even, e even this way, it's helpful, and it's very innov innovative, and um, to connect the technology to the opera because opera is uh, coming coming to us from so long ago and uh, technology is so new and it's kind of a place where the old and new meet and I think it's very interesting for our generation to see this. Yeah and you know Roberto when I think about Cunning Little Vixen speaking of old and new meet this is a opera that is also okay. uh, supposed to be made so that younger people right the whole family can come out enjoy uh, it. Why do you think this is also a good opera for kids to come to and enjoy experience, especially if they don't have a lot of experience with opera? Well, I, I would say the first thing is that the music is really beautiful and it's really accessible for any kind of audience. And it's it's a story about animals and life. There's nothing too, you know, hardcore uh, intense ab about it. I would say it's kind of like Lion King age plus, you know, they're even in the Lion King, you know, there's a sad moment, mm -hmm. but um, kids will be able to see animals. To and like Mane was saying, the visuals are so attractive because all of the animals, uh, the characters poke their heads through the wall, as she said, and they're like cartoons. Mm. So they really become the animals, and then all of the humans are in front. And um, but anyway. Uh, it, it's really, um, it's visually very, very appealing for kids and for adults. It's, it's really worthwhile. Well, this leads me to why this was the opera to select, because uh, I don't know if you know this, Roberto, there's a lot of operas. <laughs> but you guys chose Cunning Little Vixen for this show, and I'm sure that was with intentionality. So why did you decide for this show we're going to go with that one? Uh, well, I, I think it's, um, it speaks to everyone. It speaks to everyone everyone of any age. So if you're a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, you're going to love seeing all, all the nature, the animals, the beautiful music. There's a children's chorus, adult cor chorus on stage. And then if you're an adult, you're also going to enjoy those same elements. But it's actually quite a profound story. It's a sort of full, a full circle, a circle of life, really profound moral story. Um, and as I said before, it's really... Um, musically very approachable and gorgeous it has beautiful melodies beautiful love duet uh and it's a wonderful feature for our orchestra yeah no well i'm looking forward to that Mane, i think one interesting thing about this though is not only 
are you the uh, lead here? But you also have a close personal connection <laughs> to the conductor as you guys are both married. What's it like working with uh, your spouse in this space? Because I think I might be a little bit nervous, you know, having a cranky day or something like that. You don't want to. But for you, uh, is that a kind of a complication? And that's this actually goes to both of you. I don't want to put you just on the spot, <laughs> Monet. But what's it like working with uh, your spouse for a production like this? You know, we've been trying to work together for a long time. Is this the first time? No. No, okay. this is the second time Ooh. after we met. Oh, okay. uh, so we met while working together five years ago, and um, we haven't worked together since. Um, and we really enjoy working together and making music together. Of course, I was nervous because if I made mistakes and stuff, I'd be like, oh, my God, his wife is making <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Roberto? It's wonderful. Uh, we... Well, obviously, we had a great working relationship five, yeah. year, five years ago because now we're married. You know, we, we really, <laughs> it was an incredible bond, obviously, artistically as well as personally. But uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be able to, uh, you know, go to work and then go home together. Yeah. It's, it's kind of not uh, very common, especially because Mane is incredibly busy all over the world and she sings 70% of her contracts overseas. So we got very lucky. We had to do some like uh, jigsaw puzzle with a schedule to yeah. make this work. She had to cancel a few contracts to make it work. Oh, this is good. Uh, See, now I've learned the insight. What we just need to do is mm-hmm. have our local folks just marry the big time uh, performers out there That's so we right. get that inside line. <laughs> They're like, what are you going to do? Disappoint your husband and not do the show? Come on now. We got to get this, this going. All right, guys. I can't take up all of your time, but it's been enjoyable. Cunning Little Vixen. You can get tickets online at DetroitOpera.org. Thank you both so much for joining us. Roberto Cobb, con- conductor for the show and the Detroit Opera's music director, as well as Mene uh, Galoyan, who is a soprano singing the title role of Vixen in the show. Thank you so much both for joining us on the Metro. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. It is the Metro on 1019 WDET. I am Nick Austin here hanging out with you for the day. And one of the things that you might be doing if you're trying to get tickets for The Cunning Little Vixen, using the internet to get them. We just mentioned the website, DetroitOpera.org, and it makes us realize how our lives rely on the internet so much right now, and stable internet. But there are a lot of threats to internet connectivity, from underseas rock slides to cyber attacks that can put that at risk. NPR's Jenna McLaughlin reported on this story. On March 14th, major swaths of Western and Southern Africa went offline thanks to a rock slide underwater. In Pakistan in February, government officials cut off internet browsing on mobile devices, arguing it was necessary to prevent violence as voters headed to the polls. In Ukraine and Gaza, bombs and missiles have destroyed networks, isolating people at war from the rest of the world for days and weeks at a time. And in the U.S. in late February, AT&T customers lost network service because someone made a mistake while updating the network. The Internet is very vulnerable at a number of different levels. That's David Belson. He leads data analysis at Cloudflare. The technology company comes out with quarterly reports about Internet disruptions around the world. There are the things that people don't think about until they break, uh, you know, submarine cables and, you know, those, those sorts of pieces of infrastructure. This year so far, in over 120 countries, Belson and his team have tracked disruptions caused by cables damaged underwater, cyber attacks, government action, power outages, technical errors, and war. I asked Belson if the internet is becoming more vulnerable, given how many different ways it can be disrupted, on purpose or by accident. The good and the bad news is, he doesn't think it's getting worse. We're just more aware of it. I think the continued importance of the internet to everyday life, uh, you know, with more and more things moving online. I'm reading stories recently about people where their their doctor's office, you know, basically requires them to be online in order to interact with them, uh, things like that. As we depend more and more on being connected, experts need to prioritize defending against potential threats to connectivity, Belson says. That includes things like clearly labeling undersea cables, for example, so ships don't drop their anchors on them. It also means preparing for global events that could cause disruptions. I think one of the interesting things to watch over the course of this year will be it's a big year for elections as well as uh, the Olympics. 
So I think we're going to see both potential disruptions around the world, as well as, you know, spikes in traffic. But, Belson says, it's important not to panic. More often than not, it's something getting screwed up uh, as opposed to a massive scale cyber attack. That was NPR's Jenna McLaughlin reporting on the fragility of the Internet. This is the Metro, and coming up, we'll talk about a new play being shown at the Detroit Public Theater. It's the Metro on 101.9 WDET, and the Detroit Public Theater is closing its ninth season with a story that takes you back of house. The play is called Clyde's, and it brings you into the world of formerly incarcerated people working at a sandwich shop. It was written by Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Lynn Nottage, and it's now running at the Detroit Public Theater through June 2nd. Courtney Burkett is the co-founder of the Detroit Public Theater and is the director of Clyde's. She spoke with WDET's Ryan Patrick Hooper about what viewers should expect. Once you walk into the theater, you will be in the kitchen. Um, You will be in Clyde's kitchen. uh, And it is a really beautiful set um, designed by a woman named Amelia Baranski. um, And it really does feel like you are... Um, back of house in a in a sandwich shop. You get to meet a group of coworkers who all work for a woman named Clyde um, at Clyde Sandwich Shop. It's a um, truck stop sandwich shop off the freeway. It's the kind of place that people don't often stop. Um, it's the kind of place that people pass through. Um, most of the clients are truckers, um, and you get to meet the people who work there and work with Clyde. Um, but visually, it's really quite spectacular. We um, have some really great partners um, in Union Joints, um, and they really. Uh, were really great in donating and loaning us a lot of equipment to give us um, a real, very authentic feel. We have a a giant fryer. We have a giant grill. We have um, sandwich-making stations all throughout. So it really does look like you're inside of a restaurant when you walk in to see Clyde's at Detroit Public Theater. You're probably going to hate this comparison. I'm not trying to draw obvious comparisons, but It does make me think of people are obsessed with the bear on FX. We are obsessed with chef culture of getting a look behind the scenes. How much does Clyde's tap into that peek behind the curtains for the audience? It's right there. It is right there in the same world. Um, The bear came up a lot in our process um, and just talking about how people live in these spaces and what it's like to work in these kind of crowded, kind of loud, kind of um, sensory overloading spaces, the pressure of having the public needing you, the bell being rung with a new order coming up, just all those different, the sounds of the fryers, the sounds of the dishes and the dishwasher, all of that, um, the the culture of the kitchen is very much a character in this play. I do love the way you're able to modify your space at Detroit Public Theater. Every time I've been there, you don't know what you're going to get because you can really change the seating around. You can change the way the, the production design is done. So it's always very immersive and also really different from whatever you saw before at Detroit Public Theater. Yeah, that was a big part of our vision when we were building the space. Um, It was something that we started doing when we were in residence at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, where we were for the first five years of our life. Um, And then as we um, came into our own permanent home, we wanted to keep that flexibility so that every design team can read the play and decide the world that they want to create and and not have um, the footprint of the stage, but to be be able to figure out where do they want the stage um, in this room and how what is the audience's relationship to the stage um, in for this production and what serves it best. So we love that flexibility. I think audiences love that flexibility, too, of walking in to the world of the play and being surprised every time. You, as the director, have a lot of say in in what that looks like, what that feels like. People hear the term, they can probably understand somewhat what a director does, but if we're already in the kitchen looking behind the scenes, give us your behind the scenes of, of what it's like to direct a play. Well, first of all, it starts with the play itself, obviously the script. Um, there's a lot of information that a playwright gives you um, before you ever start. So the, the process really begins with that. So um, a kind of in communion with the playwright and with what they've given, because um, there's a lot of information. And then the, the biggest part of a director's job, I would say, is, is casting. Um, and if you get the right people in the room, 
and they're appropriate for the roles and they have the skills necessary to do the job and then the great the design team that comes together as well. So it's not just actors who put on a show. There's also scenic designers and sound designers and costume designers and props designers um, and working on all these different elements who are meeting regularly and building this world together. So making sure that everybody's voices are, are being heard, um, that we've got the appropriate time, we've got the appropriate space to work on it. Um, we rehearse for about 30 hours a week when we're in rehearsal. So we have the whole team in the room um, the first day and we do a read through um, and hear the play, let the designers hear the play and talk about the world that we want to create. The design team has started a few weeks before um, or months before um, having production meetings and starting to talk about it. But once the actors get in the room and we get to hear everyone and see everyone, um, it really starts to come to life. And then we spend a few weeks in that room just um, figuring out the movement, figuring about out the entrances and the exits, and and talking a lot about kind of the through line. What happens in this play? What are the events of this production? What are the events of this story? Um, and so we work through all of that together, um, and it's a really joyful process if you're doing it right. Um, but it's also really, really hard work. If you're doing it right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Some are easier than others, I'm sure. Yes. So we know the setting. We, we know the feel for Clyde's. But, yeah, what is the beating heart of this story, some of the themes that we're going to be dealing with? Everybody who works at Clyde Sandwich Shop is formerly incarcerated, including Clyde herself. And so um, these are people who don't have a lot of options about, um, you know, for employment, places that they can work. Um, and so, you know, how they found themselves in this place um, and then how they um, how they respond to the environment around them. Um, there's a marvelous character named Montrellis um, who really is kind of, they call him the sensei. Um, and he has really elevated the art of sandwich making for this group of people um, and really taught them to to value their work and to understand that there is value in work um, and to really invest in making these sandwiches and that that represents so much more. Um, and then kind of the polar opposite of Montrellis is Clyde, who um, is an oppressive leader. <laughs> she um, she uh, doesn't create a warm and welcoming environment for her employees, but um, she does create an environment for her employees. She creates a place, creates opportunity for them when there are few opportunities. So she creates a lot of conflict for her employees. And so how they choose to respond to some of her abuses um, and how they choose to support each other. Um, it's really about coming together and really uh, the art of the sandwich making. Courtney Burkett is the director of Clyde's. The play is being staged at the Detroit Public Theater now through June 2nd. Tickets are available at DetroitPublicTheater.org. This is the Metro on 1019 WDET. I am Nick Austin here hanging out with you and letting you know that Street Eats, the downtown program, returns today and each weekday in Cadillac Square. The region's best food trucks will serve up a wide array of cuisines. There are set over 75 food trucks participating in the program and people can find their returning favorites, but also many new food trucks in this year's lineup getting you feeling about the food and the things that are happening here in and around town on the Metro. But one of the new things that we have here is the Passenger Recovery Community Center, one of Metro Detroit's new substance abuse recovery support support pit spaces. It's free for people in Detroit, Hamtramck, and those strolling through town. Directors Chris Tate and Brian Wolf told WDET's Nargis Rachman about how the center uses music and works with musicians toward recovery. Chris began this conversation by discussing why the two started this nonprofit. Well, we started as a nonprofit in 2016 here in Amtramic to help touring musicians who were coming through the Midwest in recovery. My experience as somebody who's been doing that for 20 years was that it was very difficult to find any kind of support especially in early recovery. Uh, in the Midwest, the drives are longer between gigs. Free time is in short supply. So our goal was to we just let local promoters know that we were there to take people to sport groups or get coffee or laundry or whatever was going to remove them from potentially you know, toxic surroundings. We were operating out of my house. Uh, my wife and I, we have a s small like studio, typical Hamtramck bungalow. So there are a bunch of little rooms, and one of them was a studio. So we offered that up as a clean green room, so like a dressing room. 
in 2022, we became an actual recovery community organization, which is to say we were accredited through Faces and Voices of Recovery, which is a national organization. We began working towards support from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And so the beginning of this year was kind of the launch of what, what we have here now as a community center. It's really important to have a welcoming space. The point of passengers also that we're taking our experience as musicians and uh, the, the work that Chris did early on to support musicians on tour. We're trying to turn that around and offer musical, other kinds of artistic activities to the population here, to people in Hamtramck, to our neighbors, to the members of this really diverse community. Can you talk about some of the services you provide in terms of if people are curious, if they need help or if they want help, and from kind of like A to Z, like how does that work? Well, we start with outreach. So we go to um, local food banks like the amazing Detroit Friendship House, storefronts, businesses, I mean, churches, anywhere we can go to try and spread awareness of the information that, and the services we provide, uh, which include peer support and recovery coaching. For me, as somebody who has been sober for 13 years, I've really, over the last few years, by working through other organizations, been able to see the benefits of a recovery coach, you know, before they even have made a decision to either go to treatment or re- receive clinical services. They're either concerned about the direction their life is going or the choices they may or may not make. In communities like Hamtramck, there's a lot of stigma around getting help, especially in substance abuse spaces. What are some things that you're doing to tackle that issue in this community? And what we're doing is trying to do very respectful, cautious outreach through going to the different uh, facilities that are here. We've, we had the pleasure of uh, welcoming Representative Ayash, the floor leader, um, here last week, and he pointed us to some, some contacts that we're going to be um, following up on. So it's about reaching out and just, again, gently and carefully making people aware of the fact that we're here, that we're very non-judgmental, that it's a discreet, safe place, and that our services are free. All we're trying to do is lower barriers to make it easier for people to get through whatever issues they may be dealing with, whether it's housing, food, clothing, legal issues, DUIs, things like that. It can be any number of things. And it's important, I guess, too, to mention the fact that most people with any kind of substance abuse issue have been doing it for a long time. And also making it clear to people, which had to be made clear to me too, you're not going to turn these things around immediately. It's going to take some time. You have to be patient. You have to keep working on it. And you're going to see amazing progress if you do so. Is there anything that you have available in different languages? Right now, we're working through an app called Genie that is a translation service for, I think, just about any language. Um, and we've been able to utilize it a few times here. That's definitely going to be a work in progress. I mean, we what we need is, is time to grow and time to gather the right workforce and the right volunteers. In terms of funding, where are you getting the money and uh, what other resources do you need to be successful? Well, right now we're supported by a Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, an MDHHS grant for the, the bulk of our activities here. As a, as a group within Michigan, the RCOs are looking towards other funding opportunities. There's, of course, hopefully there's going to be some sustainability that is provided by these state agencies. And we are very assiduously working to really get to the point where we have um, for at least, let's say, a one and a half to two year period, some predictable sustainability so we can continue our work. What are some other challenges that you feel like you are looking to overcome or work through while you're here in Hamtramck? I mean, the recovery community organization model is in kind of a pioneering space. So it's important for us to prove the need for sustainability. And we've already seen the benefit to the community. I mean, for me personally, as somebody who's in recovery, there was a long period of time, like a decade plus, where there was one 12-step meeting here a week in Amtramming. And so as somebody who was trying to stay clean in my own stomping ground, so to speak, but also in a music community, we always felt like there was a real need for something that reflected the the creativity and the kind of the sparkle that Hamtramck has. Sometimes living in Hamtramck, there is a disconnect between the immigrant communities and the artistic or musical community. Is there anything else that you feel like you have to work through to bridge those gaps. Things change pretty pretty rapidly here. As, as a friend has said, all eyes are on him tramming around the globe, I feel like, because of some of the things that have happened here, but also because of the ways that some of the, these cultures get along. When, when you have these different, this many different populations, and it's they're all a majority underserved populations, people are gonna get butt heads. But pretty incredible community with regards to, we may not get along, but we respect each other. Director Chris Tate and Brian Wolf run the Passenger Recovery Community Center in Hamtramck. They spoke with WDET's Nargis Rahman about their service.
This is the Metro on 1019 WDET. And coming up, we'll talk about the found footage festival happening at Hamtramck's Planet Ant. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET. I'm Nick Austin here hanging out with you. And when you were hanging out back in the 80s on the weekend, what did you do between the handfuls of Cheetos and Mountain Dew? Well, before Netflix and YouTube, before TikTok and all the various streaming services, it was the VHS tape that ruled the day. In fact, it's how many of today's filmmakers gained their love for movies, renting tapes from their local video store. It was like a special experience to see what special movies and finds you could have in the store. But what if you were in the mood for something that was really out there? Growing up in the early 90s in Wisconsin, comedians Nick Brewer and Joe Pickens, in their search for entertainment, began collecting random videotapes. Their collections grew over the years, becoming so funny to friends that they viewed the tapes with that eventually they made a tour out of it. Now known as the Found Footage Festival, the event will head to Planet Ant in Hamtramck on May 12th as part of its 20th anniversary tour. To learn more about the festival, we're joined by festival co-creator Nick Brewer. Nick, welcome to the Metro. Thanks for having me, Nick. Hey, I'm happy to have you here too because I want to just find out from the jump uh, what caused you to start searching for these VHS tapes in the first place? Uh, boredom. Yeah, yeah uh, that's what it always is. You know, yeah, I think the best ideas are born out of boredom sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, my buddy Joe and I, we, we've known each other since we were 10. We grew up in a small town in Wisconsin. Wasn't a lot going on entertainment-wise. And instead of, you know, getting into real trouble, we would hang out at thrift stores and look for things to entertain ourselves and and VHS tapes started turning up in the 90s, but not movies. Those were too precious. So it was, you know, um, instructional videos that came with beard trimmers and, <laughs> and uh, training videos and potty training tapes that ended up there that people didn't want anymore and, and exercise videos. And we would buy them for a dollar, and uh, on a Friday night, we'd, we'd watch them and, and have viewing parties. This is astonishing to me that these would even end up at thrift shores in the first place, right? Like, you got your beard, beard trimmer, you know how it works, so now you think somebody else will need <laughs> this beard trimmer video? Yeah, I don't know. I guess it just yeah it goes in with the electric foot massager and whatever else you're throwing out. Uh, you know, the box of tapes goes. So we found people's, like, home movies that have just ended up at a Goodwill, and uh, they're usually boring, but sometimes you're like, wow, here's a little window into somebody's life. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of seems like really the forerunner to YouTube, right? Because a lot of people would see how much we're sharing. And before America's Funniest Home Videos, right before YouTube, before TikTok, this isn't a, a new invention. People were recording themselves on VHS cassettes from what I'm hearing from you and then just giving them to thrift stores. Yeah, it you know, there is something voyeuristic, too, about finding it at a thrift store rather than, you know, having it be your own home movie or your own videotape. And that that's part of the, the fun and part of the, I don't know, anthropological interest of it. But, you know, it's it's a comedy show. We're finding unintentionally videos that unintentionally funny videos that were, I don't know, maybe misguided in some way. And, you, you know, when you talk about this era of VHS, one thing it has on YouTube is that YouTube, everybody's pretty savvy now. They know that their video might be seen by the world, but when you're making a Pizza Hut training video and trying to be cute with it, <laughs> you're just thinking somebody's going to watch that in a break room, you know, not yeah. on a big screen somewhere with a bunch of weirdos. Yeah, I think about the countless uh, ads Hulk Hogan did, uh, the professional wrestler over in Japan, that you can clearly see he had no clue would ever make their ways back over here. But, yeah, let's talk about this festival. Um, for people who haven't had a chance to experience it, I mean, where, how did it grow and what do people see when they come to the show? I mean, it's essentially like, you know, being in uh, our parents' living room uh, in uh, the 90s watching videos with us. We've, we've just curated it a little more. So we, uh, you know, like we take all the best exercise tapes we found over the last uh, you know, couple of years and put it together into a three-minute montage. 
um, with videos like uh, Praiser Size, you know, which is a religious exercise tape. We have one called <laughs> Oral Aerobics for people who have had mouth surgery and need to work their tongue and things like that. Um, we have a speaking of wrestling, we have a Rowdy Roddy Piper exercise tape that is uh, he does a lot of screaming in it. And uh, so that's in a little montage, and it's uh, it's a guided tour through our latest VHS finds with uh, a running commentary, and we even will fly to go meet the people that we've tracked down from these weird videos and, and play our interviews with them. So, yeah, we, we sort of are the, the tour guides through this, you know, wonderful, weird uh, world of video. I appreciate that because there's a lot of weird video out there. I I enjoy weird video also. You do. You talk to the people that come to the show. What do you think it is about these finds and these interesting videos uh, that make them so enjoyable for people? Well, it was a moment in time where there was this sort of charming naivete where people were just trying out ideas and seeing what stuck. You know, we found a video called Rent a Friend from 1986, which is a, a sincere video created for if you were lonely this guy would be your virtual friend for 45 minutes yeah it was like you know he'll ask you questions like where are you from and then say like oh oh interesting yeah it's a nice part of the country you know, oh, wait a second. so it's like you he's just he leaves you space for you to fill in your own responses yes <laughs> yes that was an idea that somebody actually thought would take off in 1986 so it, it's just this, um, it was a strange moment in time where it was a gold rush. You know, Jane Fonda's workout sold millions of copies and a bunch of mom and pop uh, video production companies sprung up trying to find the next big thing. And and every time we think we're going to run out of videos um, that are so ridiculous we want to show them to people, we find a whole new batch. And uh, there's something transformative about watching them in a dark room with a bunch of other people because – you know, like I say, this is a video. These are videos meant to be watched, you know, to exercise at home or to train you how to, you know, sell a new product at Pizza Hut. And here we are all watching them 40 years later in a dark room. It's it's almost like cathartic. Yeah, I got about a minute left, but I do want I mean, we know about the show that's happening May 12th. But is there another way for people to interact with you and these videos if they want to find out some other experiences? Like, do you ever curate portions online or do you have anything that's going on? there? Yeah. You know, we save our best stuff for um, the live shows. We want those to be special, yeah. you know, communal experiences. But during the pandemic, we started a YouTube show called VCR Party on Tuesday nights. Um, at nine o'clock where we're just live from our, you know, cluttered office full of 13,000 videos, uh, popping in tapes, new things we found that week. And just, you know, just kind of showing things pretty raw as we find them. And we have special guests like David Cross and Kyle Mooney on to watch videos with us. And, um, so that's kind of one way that, you know, uh, if you can't make it out to the show or if you want to interact with us, uh, on a weekly basis, if you're a glutton for punishment, (laughs) <laughs> you can watch us on our, our YouTube channel every week. All right. So hey, get a taste of it to find out what you're going to experience before that show that's, again, happening on May 12th. It's part of the 20th anniversary tour. Who is happening at Planet Ant in Hamtramck? Who knew found footage would grow so big to move from a Wisconsin basement into a touring show for 20 years? So props to you, uh, Nick Brewer, for uh, uh, making that happen. Again, I'm speaking with Nick Brewer, who's the co-creator of of the Found Footage Festival. Nick, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Thank you, Nick. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET. I am Nick Austin, and that event, like I mentioned, will be at Planet Ant in Hamtramck on May 12th, part of that 20th anniversary tour. You can find out more information at foundfootagefestival.com. But that's going to do it for this edition of the Metro for Monday, May 6th. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org, and make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. The show is produced by Sam Corey, David Lines, and Jack Philbrandt. Our engineer is Nate Bender. The Metro is a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University. If you like what you hear and want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate. This is 1019 WDET-FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. We'll see you tomorrow.